Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Silva. Thank you for joining me for this talk on Seroquel, Ketiapine. I recently did a video on the armamentarium of medications that's available to us for the treatment of insomnia, just sort of the general classes that I think about when a patient comes to me complaining of insomnia. But I forgot to mention Seroquel, Ketiapine, which is probably used more frequently to treat insomnia than it is even for its FDA-approved indications. It's primarily a second-generation antipsychotic agent and mood stabilizer but it is used a lot, especially by primary care for the treatment of insomnia. And it's definitely not the best choice for that type of treatment. Initially, I was quite loath to use ketiapine for sleep because of the risks of tardive dyskinesia and metabolic syndrome with chronic use. We're trying to rule out type two diabetes and dyslipidemia elevated cholesterol or a bad HDL to LDL, good and bad cholesterol ratio. But Seroquel is a low potency agent, so the risk of tardive dyskinesia, TD, is much lower than with the higher potency agents such as Risperdal or the first generation antipsychotic Haldol. It is a cumulative risk, so dosage and potency are important over time. As far as metabolic syndrome, that's something that can be monitored for in the short term by monitoring a patient's weight and measuring their girth as measured at the umbilicus, as well as by following lab work. So my opinion on this has since softened a bit, and I think that we can probably justify its use in low doses over short periods of time, particularly in those patients who might benefit from Seroquel's other pharmacodynamic effects beyond simply sedation. It can help the mood, though uh, the doses that it's used for for sleep, it's probably not going to. It's probably not going to touch the mood. It's still not one of my first line agents, certainly, but whereas I used to move patients off of it, patients who would come to me and they were already taking it because they had been previously prescribed it by another practitioner, I would dismiss it. I would explain to the patient why I didn't like to prescribe it and I would take them off. Now, I'm not so quick to take them off if they're doing well on it, but I still explain to them what the risks and benefits are so that I can make sure that we have informed consent moving forward. And I'm still loath to continue taking it for a long time. So that's probably why I forgot to mention it when I was talking about all the things that I think of when it comes to treating sleep. But many of you out there maybe have been prescribed it for sleep or are taking it for sleep. And so I wanted to cover it briefly. And I thought I'd go ahead and talk to you about Seroquel in general beyond its use as a hypnotic agent. I don't know how the use of Seroquel as a sleeping pill got started. It's definitely something that's beyond the scope of what it was intended to do or what an expert psychopharmacologist would think to do, particularly with so many other options available to us, it's probably safe to use. I had one patient that did develop diabetic ketoacidosis while she was taking the maximum dose of Seroquel. I do think it was the Seroquel that caused it. It was a medical emergency and she was rushed to the hospital. However, she was a patient with psychotic bipolar disorder who got psychotic very quickly and Seroquel serving both as her antipsychotic and her mood stabilizer and she's still on it. So now she's being treated for type 2 diabetes, but she's taking Seroquel plus some Risperdal which is another second generation antipsychotic agent. And she's doing very well on that combination. But when you're talking about patients who don't ever get psychotic, who don't need a mood stabilizer, who don't even have depression necessarily, I just think it's a poor sleep aid because there are so many other medications that are available that don't have those risks. So even if the risk of tardive dyskinesia is theoretical, and even if the risk of metabolic syndrome can be monitored and managed, there are a lot of other medications. It causes sedation through its potent histamine type 1 receptor antagonism. So it's an antihistamine, a prescription strength antihistamine. And there are certainly other psychotropic medications that have that same mechanism of action. 
that might be just as useful that wouldn't have that problem. So please see my recent The Insomnia Armamentarium video for more on the different classes of medications that are available to us and what might inform our choice of one agent over another. Regardless, Seroquel as a hypnotic agent is in widespread use and again, it's probably not so harmful in the short term. So I just wanted to say that, I wanted to add that as a coda to my last video and I thought I'd go ahead and talk about Seroquel. It is an atypical antipsychotic agent, a serotonin dopamine antagonist, also called a second generation antipsychotic and a mood stabilizer. It's FDA approved for the treatment of acute schizophrenia in adults. This is both the immediate and the extended release preparations. There is a Seroquel XR, extended release. The immediate release is also approved for children ages 13 to 17. Now, when we say acute schizophrenia, schizophrenia is a chronic illness. It's lifelong, it's neurodegenerative. It gets worse over the lifespan, and it includes negative symptoms as well as positive symptoms. And by negative symptoms, we are also talking about cognitive symptoms. And so it is a, a poor prognosis over the lifespan. It's not like once a person gets sick for the first time, usually in their early 20s, that they go into remission or they get all better. Even at their best baseline, they're symptomatic with both positive and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions and negative symptoms like cognitive deficits and affective flattening and decreased speech and decreased volition and symptoms that look a lot like depression. And comorbid major depression is quite common as well in those individuals. It's a really unfortunate syndrome. It's one of the worst syndromes in psychiatry, certainly one of the worst prognoses. However, patients can be very stable on their medications, and then for one reason or another, usually because they stop taking their medication, or a lot of times because they start using drugs, and then sometimes just because they get worse, they'll have an acute exacerbation where suddenly their symptoms become acute. They become acutely paranoid or acutely agitated, or those patients that are prone to major mood episodes suddenly become manic. Patients with schizoaffective disorder, for example, will have a manic episode and they'll require a dosage adjustment or hospitalization to get them back on their medications. And so when we talk about the treatment of schizophrenia, acute versus maintenance treatment, we're talking about medications that are approved to settle them down and to get them back to their baseline when they're acutely ill versus medications that are approved to prevent these relapses. According to the FDA, only extended release catiapine has been shown to be effective for schizophrenia maintenance treatment, that is, preventing these acute decompensations. There are no age specifications for this indication, but when we're talking about preventing decompensation over the long term, those studies would have been conducted in adult subjects. Schizophrenia is an illness that begins in early adulthood. Child schizophrenia is rare. Immediate release catiapine, given on a daily basis, should also be effective. It just hasn't received FDA approval for this indication. Both preparations are approved for the treatment of acute mania in adults as monotherapy all by itself, as well as using catiapine as an adjunct to lithium or valproate valproic acid or Depakote. And the immediate release form is approved as monotherapy or as an adjunct in children ages 10 to 17. The extended release is not approved for children. And that's simply because the FDA didn't study it in kids. Or if they did, they didn't have convincing data. So the FDA can't sanction it. Doesn't mean it wouldn't work, but it would be off label. And it's always best to stay on label as much as possible, particularly when treating children. So the XR simply is not approved in kids. Both preparations are approved for bipolar maintenance treatment. Now, when we're talking about bipolar disorder, those individuals do experience full inter-episode recovery. They do get asymptomatic when they're no longer depressed or they're no longer manic. And by the way, not all of those individuals have psychosis. They don't all get psychotic, but Cotypine is a good mood stabilizer. It treats affective symptoms, so you don't have to have psychosis. It settles down mania, and it also is useful for depression, and so it can 
help someone who is in the middle of an episode, and it can also be used to prevent future episodes. And that's in bipolar disorder. Both immediate release and extended release preparations are approved for the treatment of bipolar depression, that is, major depressive episodes in the context of a bipolar spectrum illness. And the extended release preparation is approved as an adjunct in the treatment of major depressive disorder. So not by itself, but to add on to another antidepressant in patients that maybe are partially responsive to an antidepressant and you want something a little bit more or maybe they're not 100%, they're almost well, they're not quite in remission, maybe they're having trouble sleeping, so that would be a good reason to bring it on board, not just as a sleeping pill, but also because you need an adjunct. And it's important to note, it's not approved for the treatment of major depression all by itself. And there's really no evidence that all by itself it's good enough, but adding it onto an antidepressant, an antidepressant per se, it's a good strategy. Now, as far as the XR being approved for that and the immediate release not being approved for that, there's certainly no reason to believe that the immediate release would not also be useful. Again, it simply wasn't proven to the FDA, but I would have a much greater confidence using immediate release catiapine for the treatment of major depressive disorder as an adjunct than I would using catiapine off-label in a child. It's used off-label though in the treatment of a lot of other conditions. If it works, clinicians are going to prescribe based on their experience. And so it's used in other psychotic disorders. There are lots of other psychotic disorders besides schizophrenia and psychotic major mood disorders. It's also been used in mixed manic episodes. Those are manic episodes that include a mixture of depression and mania co-occurring, dysphoric mania. It's also been used to treat behavioral disturbances in dementia, although there's a black box warning about the usage of antipsychotic agents in patients with dementia-related psychoses. So if an individual is psychotic and they have dementia, the use of antipsychotic agents in that population has been shown to increase the risk of potentially fatal cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. That's specifically in dementia-related psychoses, not just in dementia. In particular, behavioral disturbances in Parkinson's disease, as well as Lewy body dementia, and the psychosis that you sometimes see in Parkinson's disease, secondary to treatment with levodopa, because you can see hallucinations and paranoia, and sometimes mania even, when you give levodopa, which is a medication that increases dopamine, in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Seroquel is good in that population because it has a much lower incidence of extrapyramidal symptoms, of drug-induced Parkinsonism. So you're not going to exacerbate those motor symptoms as much as you would if you used Risperdal, for example. All of the second-generation agents, the atypical antipsychotic agents, because of their pharmacodynamics, have less medication-induced Parkinsonism than the first-generation agents, but Seroquel in particular, as a low-potency agent, has a lot less than, say, for example, Risperdal, which has the same pharmacodynamics, blocks the same receptors, but is a much higher potency agent. And additionally, we see Seroquel being used off-label to treat behavioral disturbances in children and adolescents, as well as disorders associated with impulse discontrol, such as gambling disorder. And finally, its use has been described in the treatment of resistant anxiety conditions, post-traumatic stress disorder in particular. Seroquel's mechanism of action is that it blocks dopamine type 2 receptors. This reduces the positive symptoms of psychosis, hallucinations and delusions, and agitation, and it stabilizes affective symptoms. That is, it is a mood stabilizer. It treats mania. As a second generation agent, it also blocks serotonin 2A receptors, the 2A receptor subtype. And Doing that enhances dopamine release in certain brain regions, which is the reason why there are less motor side effects on these medications than with the first generation. In addition, though, to less of these motor side effects, blocking the 2A receptors improves cognition and it improves depression and anxiety. 
So it's not just that the second generation agents have less EPS, they're also better agents for the treatment of psychotic symptoms with a lot of affective disturbance or to be used as adjuncts in the treatment of major depression, particularly treatment refractory major depression. Seroquel is also a partial agonist. It partially stimulates serotonin 1A receptors, 5-HT1A receptors. And these two are probably contributing to the beneficial effects on mood and cognition. 5-HT7, serotonin 7 receptors are also blocked and that's also thought to contribute to the beneficial effects including the procognitive effects. It's also a 5-HT2C antagonist and that's where you get the weight gain from this medication. It also blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine to some extent. The sedating action as we've said is due to blocking histamine type 1 receptors. The usual dosing range is 400 to 800 milligrams for schizophrenia and mania. Bipolar depression can typically be managed with a daily dose of 300 milligrams at bedtime. And so you'll often see Seroquel XR 300 milligrams being prescribed at bedtime. Again, in conjunction with an antidepressant. When clinicians use it off-label for sleep, though, they use a tiny dose. I'm talking about the starting 25 milligram dose and usually not exceeding 150 milligrams or 200 milligrams at the very most. Really, for sleep, 200 milligrams is really on the higher end. So we're definitely exploiting a side effect at these very low doses. And we can't assume that if you give somebody 25 or even 50 milligrams of Seroquel, that we're getting any benefit for the affective or cognitive symptoms simply because we're using Seroquel as a hypnotic agent in those patients who may need antidepressant adjunct therapy. In those patients, we really need to consider increasing the dosage or using a different agent. Seroquel is often underdosed. It's often not taken up to the six or 800 milligrams that you would need to use in cases of severe acute psychosis or acute unstable mood, mania or dysphoric mania. Clinicians often, for whatever reason, elect to switch to something else before they maximize the dose. And probably because the number of milligrams is so high and it would take several days to get there. You can't titrate the dosage too fast or a person might fall down. The Seroquel can cause orthostatic hypotension. I have a whole separate video on antipsychotic side effects, a separate video that talks just about antipsychotic side effects, including tardive dyskinesia and metabolic syndrome and some of these other things. So Seroquel is rarely lethal in overdose by itself. It is approved for long-term use in schizophrenia and bipolar. It's not habit-forming, but all psychotropic agents should be tapered and weaned prior to discontinuation, particularly if you're, we're on the higher doses. This is to prevent rebound symptoms. I'm kind of glad that I left it off as a sleeping pill in that video because really it's not a good choice and it's best reserved as monotherapy in appropriate doses for its FDA indications, and that includes somewhat lower doses to treat depression, particularly in patients with bipolar depression and psychotic patients who are also depressed, and as an adjunct to treatment-resistant major depression. Thank you for listening. Comments are always welcome.